Support for Live in 225 is provided in part by the Grimm Family Center for Organic Production and Research at Cal Poly. For more information or to support the center, please visit organic.calpoly.edu. That's organic.calpoly.edu for the Grimm Family Center for Organic Production and Research at Cal Poly. Support for Live in 225 is provided in part by AgCom Central. Visit AgCom Central on twitch.tv forward slash AgCom Central or on our website, agcomcentral.com, where you can follow our social media. That's twitch.tv forward slash A-G-C-O-M-M central for AgCom Central. Support for Live in 225 is provided in part by the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication at Cal Poly. Visit aged.calpoly.edu to register for our programs or to show your support. That's ageed.calpoly.edu for the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication at Cal Poly. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us here. We are live in 225, and this is season one, episode four. Throughout this podcast, we're going to be mentioning all sorts of technical terms about organic agriculture, um, and a lot of us don't really know exactly what they mean, so today we're just going to be diving into that topic. Um, we're going to be exploring all of the different terms and definitions that um, circulate around the organic ag industry, um, and that will just help better inform us as we continue on through this podcast. Um, we are also going to be defining some terms to better understand the switch in interest from conventional ag to other methods of farming, as well as the definitions of some of those growing practices that are used in organic agriculture. Today on the panel, um, we have some lovely guest panelists. We have Tegan, who's in the production class. Say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I am on the panelists today. <laughs> Tell us a little about yeah, yourself. Little. Um, I am a senior this year at Cal Poly. I'm graduating in spring. Um, and I'm an ag home major. I actually did work on this episode of the podcast as well. So I'm super Ooh. excited. It's very lovely to have your ex- expertise yeah. Yeah. on the podcast. We, next up, we have Dr. Grishup. Say hello. Introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Matt Grishup. I'm the director of the Grimm Family Center for Organic Production and Research. I'm here at Cal Poly, a new center focused on research and education around organic agriculture. Lovely having you. And as always, we have um, our professor for this Live in 225 production class. We have Dr. Mike. Yeah, um, you know, one of your favorite ACOMS professor in all of the state <laughs> of California. I just want to say that a lot of people have been hearing about this podcast and they're, they're interested. I think we will, we'll, we'll blow up soon. So Natalie, look out for your, uh, your, your fandom coming My soon fandom. to you. My yeah. fandom. Oh boy, I can't wait. And as always, um, I'm Natalie Victorine. I am the host for this Live in 225 podcast, and I am a second year ag comms major. Yeah. Um, with that being said, and all the introductions being introduced, <laughs> let's dive into it. Yeah. Um, so the first topic that we're going to be discussing is organic agriculture. So we're just going to define that and have a little discussion yeah. about it. Well, so let me just interject here I'm, I'm wondering if we should play the man on the street interviews first and then see what the perspective is of the man on the street and then like oh. dive into individual is that does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah yeah we could do that yeah um, so in this one i know we're gonna say it right in the beginning of this video but we actually went out and spoke to s- different students on campus um about what they thought the difference between organic and sustainable agricultural practices were so it's really interesting i hope you guys enjoy it on the panel because you haven't seen this yet so all right production Great. let's see it i am here at campus market i'm gonna ask a couple people about the difference between organic ag and sustainable agriculture can you tell me the difference between sustainable agriculture and organic ag no no? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Probably not, but I feel like I should. Oh. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, that's totally cool too. I would guess that sustainable is more about like reuse and organic is about like the products you're using. Cool, perfect, yeah. thank you. Cool. Um, sustainable agriculture, oh, this is hard. <laughs> sustainable agriculture is using um, like the least amount of like environmentally toxic products that you can and then organic agriculture is like 
not using it could be like using chemicals but not like I don't I don't know actually <laughs> perfect thank you so much I do not okay perfect thank you organic agriculture versus sustainable I don't see them as mutually exclusive huh. I see that they could overlap there could be both Good answer. Do you know the difference between organic agriculture and sustainable agriculture? Is organic agriculture more like no GMOs and then sustainable is more working on like sustainability of keeping up that? Pretty much. Uh, not off the top of my head, but I could guess. <laughs> Do you want to shoot something out? <laughs> sure. Um, is organic ag... Um, like agriculture without like preservatives and pesticides and like sustainable ag is um, like regenerative agriculture where they're like rotating yeah, crops and stuff. Much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank uh, No. No, I don't. Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, do you? Uh, organics more, or, like, I don't know, grassroots. <laughs> like natural? <laughs> Yeah, natural, not as uh, industrial. Perfect, thank you. Okay, organic would be like, I guess stuff like from nature and the ground and, what was the other one? Sustainable agriculture? Sustainable, maybe like genetically engineered, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. So organic, I think, has emphasis on particularly like which products you're using or if you're using any on the agriculture. So like what kind of, if you're using any pesticides, which typically is like, you don't want to use any of that versus sustainable agriculture is looking more about the processes that you're going about use, like treating agriculture. Um, like how much water are you using? Are you taking into account kind of the climate you're in or are you trying to force a product to grow in a climate that it's not suited for and like um, acknowledging more of the resource impacts rather than the product impacts? Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can you tell me the difference between organic ag and sustainable agriculture? There's not not a whole lot. I'm not the the best expert on this. Um, totally fine. Just give us whatever you want to say. <laughs> uh, organic is mostly marketing. Um, mm. Some people think there's taste difference, there's health difference, but there's not really. Um, so uh, you can't use conventional pesticides, but you have to use lighter loads of pesticides. I just want to shout out. Um, Melissa for uh, for literally saying yeah you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty much because yeah because that's how they do it on social media right they they let people answer and like you know all right cool yeah cool. you yeah. did it and sometimes she just kind of walked away from them like <laughs> that's not her. there was definitely a wide variety of answers some of which were quite comical but hey that's what we're here for we're here that's to educate we're here. we're here to we're, it's ag comms we're all here we're all we're all gonna educate ourselves on organic agriculture. Um, so the USDA National Library of Agriculture defines organic ag as a system that in integrates cultural, biological, and me mechanical practices that foster cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. Dr. Grishup, would you like to add on, on to what, sure. you, what, we, what you would define <laughs> organic agriculture yeah, so as? It, it it, it's nuanced, but first I did want to say that it, I, I was really impressed with Melissa's grit and <laughs> going out there and, and tracking down people and getting answers from them. That, that, that takes some grit. I did make her uh, go up to quite a few people she didn't want to go up to. <laughs> well, she did it. Yeah. That's what's important. We're, we were in it together. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Well, it, it, it's, it's all about teamwork. So uh, back to the question at hand. So organic agriculture, um, you know, the first and foremost thing is that there is a legal definition within the United States for organic agriculture, and that's really under the parlance of the USDA um, Agriculture Marketing Service National Organic Program. So they um, define organic agriculture pretty close to the definition that, that was just given. Um, and there's a real emphasis on sort of the inputs used in that system. I mean, that's really where that that definition is headed. So it's really about, and, and a couple of the folks on the street really 
tackled this um, using uh, non-synthetic inputs, whether that's for protecting plants from pests or diseases um, or um, fertility products, so the types of fertilizers that are used. But the organic movement, which has been around a lot longer than the certified organic ag in the U.S., which is really started in 2002, um, the emphasis is really on the development of a, a more of a holistic um, soil-based agriculture where you're fostering healthy, biologically active soil. And, you know, all those inputs and everything are sort of what go into that, that process. So... Yeah. I can tackle sustainable ag too. Yeah, yeah. So, so the one of the biggest um, things that I noticed in the video was um, the e the overlap between sustainable mm -hmm. and organic. And a lot of people that were interviewed thought that they were um, mutually exclusive. I just I just thought it was like it was it was a almost like a trick question. Yeah, they <laughs> they were thinking a little too hard about I, it. I feel like if you did a Venn diagram. Um, one would fit in the other yeah and I, uh, if i were to think about it because i'm no e organic expert like I, mm -hmm. I could communicate about it i would say that organic production fits somewhere in the overall yeah. realm of sustainable uh, uh agriculture but just yeah. like just like dr kership said it has a legal definition yeah right and right. so that's the biggest difference i'd say is that sustainable ag um at least in the united states and i don't know of any political you know, political economic boundaries where this would be the case, I don't think there is a legal definition for sustainable ag. So that would be the first difference. But I would say... There I, is a legal definition provided by the um, the USDA. USDA, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. but there's not like a fine or a... Like there, oh. there's not a label. Mm -mm, no. So mm -mm. it's like I can call anything I want sustainable. Yep. And organic, if I if I call something organic and I'm not certified, then I'm looking at $10,000 per violation. Oh. Wow. And potentially jail time. So, so yeah, there's, I mean, it, when I say legal definition, I mean, there's actual, I mean, there's not a lot legal of enforcement, unfortunately, but there's actual legal repercussions for using that word in a way that doesn't fit the legal definition. So, yeah. but um, Dr. Mike, I think is, is pretty much right in line with my, under, my sort of thoughts on it is I look at sustainable ag as a big umbrella. And so, so there's a lot of different styles of agriculture that could fit under a sustainable umbrella um, but the first thing that I think is really critical when folks start using the word sustainable whether it's in you know you're talking about an agricultural system or you're talking about an energy system or, or anything else you know the most important first thing to think about is over what time scale and that's a piece I see left out oh. so it's sort of a, a, um, a surprisingly frequent time but you know ultimately you know nothing is sustainable forever um you know we we're, we're all we're all finite um mm -hmm. so it's really important i think if you use terms like that to think about so sustainable over a hundred years seven generations <laughs> uh one fiscal quarter i mean it it really depends on what what you're going to do and what sort of fits under that umbrella is really going to be defined by that that boundary um, yeah. So that boundary is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, and because of that, you know, there are um, conventional ag practices mm -hmm. like no-till agriculture and, and other practices where they use a lot of synthetic products, but they have some definite um, sustainability advantages by reducing tillage and, and doing, doing other things. Yeah, um, that's, so that's one of the references I was going to draw. Um, it, Organic agriculture could be a, is a part of sustainable agriculture, but conventional agriculture as well can be. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do sustainable practices in conventional agriculture, mm -hmm. and I don't want people to walk away from this um, this podcast thinking that the only way you can be sustainable in agriculture is through organic. Uh, and like Matt always says, you know, we're in it together. We have to work together and figure out the systems that work in which which situations. Yeah, yeah. definitely. The you know the wonderful thing about organic agriculture because it has a legal definition and there's a legal set of standards it um, provides the stage for really a pretty much free market solution towards promoting sustainable ag practices or a specific set of them so you know consumers pay a premium for organic produce and that premium at least some part of it hopefully gets to the folks actually doing the practices 
And I think that's that's the place where organics really shine in terms of the you know the larger sustainable ag scene. Um, and you know, no, I, as far as I know, I don't think anyone doing no-till um, grain farming in the Midwest gets a premium for their no-till practices. Um, and it, it may be that they, they can make more money because they can produce more efficiently. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why no-till is a great system. But unlike organics, there's not somebody saying, hey, you know, you're, you're being a good steward. We value, you know, the fact that that takes energy time and, and you know, it's going to cut into your margin. Here's a little bit to help you continue going. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about biodynamic agriculture yeah. and um, just describing a little bit about that because if, pe if, if, if general consumers don't know a whole lot about organics and sustainable, then, then they definitely probably do not know about biodynamics. I know that's something that I'm not yeah. very educated on. Do we have some um, people but on the street? talking about I biodynamics? I don't believe we so. Don't, oh, okay. Unfortunately. So biodynamics are fascinating and, and it's interesting. I mean, biodyna biodynamic agriculture actually predates organics and there, there are elements of biodynamic agriculture that have fed into early organic practices. So biodynamic agriculture was really conceived by a single person, Rudolf Steiner, mm -hmm. who is this um, really he was amazing. an Austrian philosopher. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> very interesting. So he dude. founded Waldorf schools. So you know, these this alternative education system that sometimes looked similarly to um, uh, Montessori, but it, it's not. Uh, it, it, it's not really based off Christian theology. Um, but Waldorf schools are, are something that Rudolf Steiner developed. So Rudolf Steiner um, really focused on traditional. Um, I guess peasant European ag systems, which were you know operating a long time before the um, beginnings of you know synthetic inputs, so synthetic nitrogen, um, synthetic pesticides, everything else, and so biodynamics has a very similar set of principles to organics, but there are some key differences. Um, the biggest of those are that there are a series of preparations that you, if you're going to be a biodynamic farmer, and you can get certified as a biodynamic farmer, it's not legally defined, but there is a third party certification system called the Demeter Society, I believe. And basically, you have to use these preparations as part of your agricultural practices. And these preparations involve taking things like stinging nettles and cow manure and other European herbs and mixing them into cow horns and then burying them like during different moon phases and mm -hmm. then digging them up and then using <laughs> those things to supplement your compost and and it's it's really interesting and, and a lot of that goes into the fact that for Steiner there is this definite metaphysical spiritual component of agriculture mm. and that, you know this gets back into sort of you know old you know basal European ag practices so you know pre pre dark ages type stuff and so there's this metaphysical balance and um early on there are actually some uh, arguments between the biodynamic movement and the organic movement so this would be you know like 1940s and earlier because the organic movement initially at least a lot of its founding thinkers like uh, Sir Albert Howard were really into, well, we've got this law of return, we have to return fertility to the land, and, and that some of that is, you know, human waste, um, that we should be, you know, harvesting these wastes and getting them back. So human is, is sort of the concept. Um, in biodynamics, that was, no, no, that's totally wrong because there's a metaphysical imbalance that you're going to introduce to the system. And so that was one area where they, they really sort of clashed a little bit. And, and those two people, um, Sir Albert Howard and Rudolf Steiner, actually overlapped in time a little bit. Um, Steiner died, oh, right around the turn of the century. Um, Sir Albert Howard died in, I want to say, 1948. So Steiner is a little older. But they, they and their sort of acolytes interacted around that. Um, 
So biodynamic has this. The other difference between biodynamic and organics in terms of certification is that if you certify a farm biodynamic, you have to certify the whole farm. A core concept is that the whole farm is this holistic sort of living spiritual organism. And uh, you can't produce just a little bit. Right. Whereas organics, um, we very much, I mean, we have a lot of growers that, you know, get into organics and they start out from a conventional, which is also weird because there's no legal definition of conventional ag, right? So it, it can be many things. But they'll start on a couple sections of their farm and sort of try out organic practices and then, you know, and then over time they either expand or stay the same or sometimes they give it up. Um, so that's a that's a major difference between the two. Yeah, you were talking a little bit about um, the push for organics and really how that started and I think that would be considered the green revolution as some like organic um, producers would, would say. And um, could you just describe a little bit more about that? The, what's the definition? Of, the Green Revolution. The, yeah, the Green Revolution yeah. is, is stated to be a push of technology transfer initiatives that saw greatly increased crop yields. Mm -hmm. And that change really began um, after World War II and spread globally into the late 1980s. Yeah, so there, I mean, the, the person you really have to talk about if you talk about the Green Revolution is Norman Borlaug. And Norman Borlaug was a grain breeder. Um, the, the interesting thing is that Norman Borlaug's family farms organically, but uh, uh, Norman Borlaug, you know, is credited with probably saving more lives than any single person in the 20th century. And, oh, really? And it's really because of his breeding efforts. And so he was uh, one of the really folks that pushed dwarf wheat varieties and breeding for disease resistance, and particularly a series of cereal rusts that attack wheat. And he was very involved with the Green Revolution in Mexico and India. And basically, by breeding wheat that was resistant to, you know, regionally specific diseases, um, but then also responded very well to synthetic inputs, so synthetic nitrogen sources, et cetera, um, yields were greatly increased. And it's really, if you, if you think about the, when I think about the Green Revolution, it's really, you know, the pyramid is sort of, you know, plant breeding on one side, um, synthetic fertilizers and, and pesticides to some extent on the other side, and then mechanization. And breeding, though, is really the major leg of that triangle. I mean, that's sort of, you know, breeding plants that are easy to harvest mechanically so that they, you know, they mature all at the same time, they're the same size, you know, a, a combine or a, a, you know, a swather or something can get through there and cut it easily is, is a big part of that. But then also breeding them so that they respond to a, you know, a synthetic a mineralized um, fertility program. So in conventional agriculture, um, the sources of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that, that are used as well as micronutrients are already sort of plant ready. I mean, they're, they're, they're set up in a way that plants can readily absorb them. In organic systems, we start with um, really amino acids and protein-based complex molecules that have to be processed by microbes before plants can access them. And that, that's closer to a natural system. I mean, that's how natural nutrient cycling functions. But to get plants to really thrive when, you know, in the disconnect of those microbial processes of breaking up nutrients, you know, there's some breeding that went on so that they responded really, you know, they can handle sort of this mass rush of, you know, available nutrition rather than a trickle, which would be more typical of a natural system. Would um, you see this green revolution as like what we now consider more conventional agriculture? Oh, absolutely. Like with GMO, GMOs and yeah, all Yeah, I that? think, yeah, genetically modified crops are really a logical extension of the green revolution. And so... And that's a really fascinating topic. I mean, what we define as genetically modified and what we don't at this point, sort of the history of, of plant breeding. Um, so really, you know, genetically modified crops, you know, beginning in the in the mid 90s, right around the time the the organic certification was was getting set up for federal government, although it didn't get applied till 2002, um, you know, basically, um, breeders were able to synthetically introduce genes for herbicide resistance and um, insect resistance into a lot of our major commodity crops. So, you know, one of the really funny things that I, I always chuckle with the, like genetically modified free foods and stuff is that I see that stamp on all kinds of foods where there, there are no genetically modified lines. I mean, basically no one's done it. So oh, really like there's no standard for, well, 
it, it, it's weird. I mean, so really, if you look at it, the, the major crops that are genetically modified and produced and consumed are really, you know, corn, soybeans, cotton, sugar beets. Um, I think there's a GM alfalfa now. There's a GM wheat, but it's never been released. Uh, papaya is actually in Hawaii, they, but they did really minor modification there for a specific for ring, the ring spot, spot virus. virus. Yeah. yeah, that's what really, I mean, they saved the Hawaiian papaya industry. They mm-hmm. were collapsing. Uh, but those are really the major crops that are genetically modified. There is a two gene, um, well, they, they, they weren't modified through traditional genetic modification, but more, more recent um, gene silencing technology. But there's a non-browning um, Fuji apple and Granny Smith apple, I believe. Um, and that's really about it. Oh, I'm sorry. And there's some rices out there. So there's golden rice, which was really modified to have a vita- high levels of vitamin A in it for, to, to help with human nutrition. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a genetically modified line of rice that I think has been released that's flood tolerant. But the interesting thing on that whole GM piece is that really the development of genetically modified technology. So, you know, back for 12,000 years since ag started, we've been crossing plants just naturally. So we're using, you know, natural sexual processes to, to move traits that we like around. Like, you know, the way we got carrots, carrots started out as a green that people ate. They ate the greens and the seeds. And then somebody went, oh, well, there's just this nice taproot. We can eat that. And then they selected for, for carrots that had a big you know, meaty taproot. And now that's what we eat. I don't, you know, you can eat carrot greens, but not just many the biggest do. difference with genetically modified foods now is right. that instead of all of those generations of um, right. crossbreeding, it's a direct right. transfer of but genes the, from one crop here's to another. The goofy thing that, that keeps, keeps me up at night when thinking about this with organics is that, okay, so then the first real sort of genetically modified modification was through mutation breeding and so uh, seedless ruby red grapefruit is a product of mutation breeding a lot of the dwarf uh, grain varieties are 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 from mutation breeding and these are things that are actually used in organic ag basically what they did this is kind of like in the better living through chemistry atomic era of the 1950s they either expose plant embryos to gamma radiation or they use oncogens, so, so you know, chemicals that cause mutations in chromosomal mutations. And so the basic idea was back in the 50s and 60s was that, well, we can't always get the traits we want in our crops, so maybe we can cause crops to mutate so we can find them. So you take thousands of plant embryos, you expose them to one of these you know, mutating factors, and then you grow them and most of them just croak or I'm sorry, die because they're, they're, you know, they can't survive, but then you get one that's like, Oh, look, we've got a seedless red flesh grapefruit. So then you can take that line and then go put it into a traditional breeding line and get that trait into the traditional breeding line. So that was really the first example of genetic modification beyond sexual selection in our plant breeding program. Then in the, in the late eighties and nineties, we figured out, you know, uh, well, through, uh, PCR polyamorous chain reaction and in our ability to start isolating, tagging, and manipulating genes, we began injecting genetically modified uh, DNA into plant embryos. And so they did this with this little like gene shotgun to begin with. It was actually, a, it was like a pneumatic gun that shot microscopic pellets of gold coated in plasmids into the nucleus of a, of a developing plant embryo. And then, it, and it's sort of still kind of random. Like you just kind of shoot this genetic material in there and maybe it attaches in a good place maybe or maybe it, works, it maybe it doesn't. Kills it. Exactly. So that's how we got like Roundup Ready or glyphosate herbicide resistant crops. That's how we got our, our um, insect resistant crops that have um, genes from bacteria that produce a, a natural insecticide, Bacillus thuringiensis. So that, that's sort of where we were up through really the early 2000s. Now we have something called CRISPR-Cas9, and, and I am far from a molecular biologist, so I don't understand the mechanisms, but basically with CRISPR-Cas9, we can go into a genome and we can silence genes. So for instance, with that non-browning apple, they didn't add anything. They turned off a, a metabolic pathway that causes apples to get brown um, when they're exposed to oxygen. Um, the other thing we can do is take gene snippets and put them in very specific parts of the genome. So, for example, um, there's a lot of breeding programs looking at this for disease resistance, where well, um, at my former employer at Michigan State University, they were working on a light blight resistant potato. Late blight is the causal agent of the Irish potato famine. 
Um, mm. So it's, it's a Phytophthora, and it, Phytophthora infestans, and it's, it's a, just a horrible pathogen. What they were able to do was go to an Andean, you know, like early line potato, find one that was resistant to late blight, identify the gene that provided that, clone that gene, and then put it into, say, a russet potato. So a potato that's ready for market. It has the production, you know, it has all that green revolution tech already <laughs> built into it. And so within five years, they were able to create a potato that was 100% resistant to late blight. And they never went outside the potato genome to do that. All the genetic material came from potatoes. Um, so that's kind of where we're living now in terms yeah. of genetic modification. And it's, it's a... Personally, I can talk about this for an hour, so I will, I will stop. But personally, I think there's some really interesting things on the horizon for the organic movement related to this. Yeah. Because I think we're probably within a decade or two. Do you think that the organic industry would be open to adopting? I they're not. I mean, they're not foods? at all, which for me, from a sustainable ag side, is, is um, unfortunate because having disease resistance at the genetic level is really great because it means you don't need things like copper or sulfur mm -hmm. to manage less plant inputs. diseases. Exactly. Less inputs and better for your soil. But on the other hand, there are, there are a lot of concerns about the sort of downstream potential impacts of, of this type of manipulation of genetic material. So right now, none of this is allowed under certified organic production. But I think the really big issue is going to be, you know, from a conventional breeding standpoint, especially for things like fruits and vegetables, it takes, well, so in, in a perennial fruit, I've, I've had plenty of colleagues who are like apple breeders and cherry breeders and things like that. They might release one or two new lines in their entire career. So, I mean, you're talking about somebody who's got, you know, gone all the way up through a PhD. So they've got, you know, like 20 years of school they spend the next 20 to 25 years and they might release one or two varieties because it takes so long through just sexual recombination and growing a tree up to the point where you actually get fruit off it that you know you just don't you don't get a lot of time to play around yeah so with crispr cas9 we can do things you know four to five times faster so where i'm going with this is in conventional breeding programs for vegetables and fruits, I suspect that in the next decade, two decades tops, we're going to see that technology completely dominate. And the, the challenge for the organics at that point is going to be most of our organic breeds come out of conventional breeding programs. Um, they're, you know, it's a smaller market, so we don't have the breeders, but, you know, sort of the cast off things that are like, well, this one's, you know, doesn't have quite the right color for the conventional market, for instance, but it's got good disease resistance. That goes into an organic breeding line. So the big question is, is if we if we get to this point where the plant breeding community is using this technology that the organic community won't accept, how are we going to get new organic varieties? And that's that's what I see as, as a big challenge um, for the next two decades. Very yeah. Like I said, I can talk for an hour on yeah, this. So I wanted to div about. divert the um, the conversation and just open up discussion um, and just ask everyone on the panel, what do you think the largest misconception about organic agriculture is? And just explain a little bit why. Is, um, is, is it appropriate here, Matt, to talk about uh, animals as well? Yeah, uh, for from breeding or well, from, we, from organics or... One of uh, the both. one yeah. of the definitions we do have on here is husbandry mm -hmm. and the care and cultivation of breeding crops and animals generally. If you wanted to talk about that at all, yeah, I I, I, I just wanted to add to my prompt or my my response to that. I think uh, a lot of the fears of you know uh, people consuming genetically modified organisms or sorry, G yeah, GMOs. Is that they're they're afraid to see you know the, the the stereotypical imagery that comes with you know genetic modification in a negative sense so the two-headed lamb or the, the the chicken with four legs or the embryo that has like six yolks in it or whatever and so you know my opinion or or my my research experience has been of the the, the I'm saying this terribly but based on my research, what I understand is, uh, especially husbandry breeders, when they breed their animals, you know, sometimes they have to go through that process, that trial and error process, which takes time, as Matt said. Um, and, you know, they take that time to breed things in. And so with GMO technology, it makes more sense, especially from an animal perspective, um, to, to get it done quicker and maybe safer for animals that, you know, come out on the back end of that, that process. And I think the fear is that consumers are going to be uh, um, 
engaging or, or consuming products that they're they're not certain is of their standards of what they consider to be um, you know safe products. But I think uh, the USDA does a good job of parametizing uh, what what is safe and what is not safe to eat. I could be wrong here, but I just wanted to bring that animal side of things into it. Yeah, well, you know this would apply to both plants and animals in the sort of second order genetic modification that I was talking about where you're injecting, you know, novel genetic material into a genome. So for instance, um, you know, you, you get a, a gene from a bacteria or a fish or something and you incorporate that into, you know, a corn plant or maybe a chicken or whatever. Um, there are some, some, semi-valid health concerns and that you've got novel proteins that are going to show up and sometimes oh. folks can be allergic to those. Um, but if you take the approach where you never leave the genome, so basically if, if the traits that I'm, say I'm breeding chickens and all of the genes I'm using come from different lines of chickens, essentially what you're doing is you're accelerating the process of getting those traits into a, a new uh, breed of chicken. Um, so rather than having to have roosters and hens mate, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 times. You're fast tracking the process to exactly. just a few generations. And, for, and, and I think there is, I mean, from an animal husbandry and sort of animal welfare standpoint, there is actually some logic in that because what happens to all those, you know, genetic lines in between when you're doing the breeding and you have to go through 20 or 30 cycles, well, they get destroyed. That's what happens to them. They don't get used for their intended purpose. Um, they may you know, they may not go anywhere. Mm. Whereas if you can, if you can um, speed that process along, you're, you're gonna have less sort of suffering um, mm. in that process. So from, from that perspective, I think there's, there's something to consider philosophically. Um, in terms of, you know, husbandry and sort of animal standards and organics, this has been one of the big controversies really some from, you know, the very beginning of certified organic production. And it really goes back to the fact that if you if you look at basal organic philosophy, um, you know the systems that were envisioned would always be animal and plant combined systems. But where we've gone in terms of modern um, agriculture is we've separated animals from plants. Mm -hmm. And from a food safety standpoint in produce industry, that that's not something that's going to change. Oh. Um, so I think that's led to a lot of sort of confusion about, well, what does an organic animal production system look like, especially if it's not integrated with a plant production system. Yeah. And, and so we've seen a lot of, a lot of issues there and there've been, you know, tons of lawsuits and, and a lot of, a lot of lobbyist money and all kinds of things going into that saying, well, and, and we've made some progress. I mean, when we first started with organic dairies, for instance, you know, most of the large organic dairies were just conventional dairies where they fed cows, organic, um, corn and soybean. Um, beginning in the in the mid 2010s, there was a standard where basically you had to feed them some amount of dry matter that was actually what cows evolved eating, which is like you know grasses and plants, mm -hmm. not corn and soybeans. Um, but it, it continues. Like what what is an organic production system for animals? And um, and I think even if you look at price differential, um, producing animals organically the price differential for doing that versus producing them conventionally is far greater than producing plants organically than There's conventionally. There's a lot of different inputs that go into that as well. Well, and just, you know, confinement. I mean, mm -hmm. um, confined animal feeding operations are, the reason they exist is that they're very, they get animals to market very, very quickly very in a large quantity, mm -hmm. which means that the consumer experience is a very affordable product at the grocery store. I, I've raised animals on pasture, and it, it's 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 like an order of magnitude more expensive to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, if Definitely. if you know if, if folks aren't willing to pay, you know, ten dollars a pound for chicken versus a dollar a pound, or you know, right? I guess right now chicken's more like two to four dollars a pound. Um, how how is the grower going to do that and and maintain sort of financial sustainability yeah well thank you so much for your input you definitely gave us a lot of insight onto this um just wanting to wrap up i wanted to ask dr mike just really quickly oh gosh uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talked a lot a lot of terms and definitions in this episode and i just wanted to bring it over to you for a quick second and just um, what, what does this mean for ad comms, huh? Yeah, what does this mean for ad comms? Like, how can, how can just the general consumer and the general student at Cal Poly 
learn a little bit more about organic agriculture besides tuning into this podcast especially since we did see a lot of cal poly students don't know what even organic agriculture is and this is a pretty big ag ag school so just take that into a bigger perspective for a student in let's say usc or berkeley or Mm. any another college that might not have a college of agriculture i i'm gonna echo what um dr fry said when we had her on the podcast you know it's Someone has to take the responsibility and, you know, ensure that the, the, the target audience get the information that they need. And so I guess a, a, as a point of reference, uh, we absolutely knew the, 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 the target audience we were going for. We were going for podcast li- a podcast listing audience. And I think a lot of uh, college level students are engaged with podcasts, even though, you know, most of them talk about crime podcasts or serial killer podcasts. I mean... There is a subsection of, of podcast listeners that are interested in being educated about, you know, the things that they consume, especially in California, which is uh, uh, there are pockets of liberal uh, individuals, especially around San Luis Obispo. So mm-hmm. I have faith in us as, you know, a class and you all as students who are taking this this project on, uh, you know, by the horns and uh, I think we're doing great things. It's a good start and, you know, resources have to be put into this. Um, but beyond this podcast, we're going to we're gonna do some great things with the information that we get and spread it yeah. to whoever we can. Exactly. And, and I, you know, one last thing I'd say to build off what, what Dr. Mike just brought up is, you know, for, for folks listening to this, talk to a farmer. I mean, go to a farmer's market or if you live in agri- an agricultural community, you know, go to the coffee shop. Talk to some farmers. Learn about, about you know, what farmers are doing in your, in your area. And then if you can, even if it's just a, a window box, try growing some, some food. It could be herbs. It could be a tomato plant. I often say if I had a magic wand, it could make one thing happen. I'd have everybody grow a tomato plant, you know, every man, woman, and child in, 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 the, in the country. And, and basically, you know, they'd be able to experience the joy and awe as this plant germinates and grows and sort of a wonderful, you know, hey, look, there's fruit. And then the abject horror when tomato hornworm comes along oh, and gosh. eats the whole thing or late <laughs> blight comes and collapses it. That's that's how we get more in touch with our food, I think, and, and our food system. And, and it, you know, it, everyone's going to do better if we can definitely. communicate about that. There are definitely lots of ag publications that are out there that are kind of trailblazing. I know that um, one of the main hosts of Top Gear, which is like this car show, Jeremy Clarkson has this show on um, Amazon Prime called Clarkson's Farm. And it's all about how he um, bought this plot of land in 2008. And then he's like, I'm going to farm it. So it's all about learning the ropes of farming and husbandry. And it's just a really interesting show. And I think that in the future, like, things like this podcast and things like that show would really just educate people and like present it to them in an, in like a, an aesthetic in a very like entertaining way, which yeah. I think is really cool. But yeah. just wrapping up, um, thank you to all of our panelists that came on the show today. That is our time for Live in 225. And thanks for just discussing and learning a little bit more about the terms and definitions of organic agriculture. All right. See you guys next time. Great podcast. Live in 225 is a production of the AGC 225 class at Cal Poly called Digital Communications and Agriculture. Program funding was provided by the California Certified Organic Farmers Foundation and the Transition to Organic Partnership Program. Our production team for this episode was Tegan Ellers and Melissa Frago. Our director for season one was Bella Anushian. Our host was Natalie Victorine. The executive producer, creator, and co-editor for the show was Moses Mike. Matt Greesop was our co-producer. Our guest for this episode was Tegan Ellers. Our audio technician was Melissa Frago, who was also our managing editor. The video switching director was Cole Stevens. Our vocal talent was Jared Mandrell. Background music by LVY Music from Pixabay. Intro and outro music by Alex Grohl from Pixabay. Thanks for joining us.